Hi, my name is Ashley Storby, Agronomy Innovation Manager with Pioneer, and with me today is Jay Zilski, field agronomist laying claim to South Central Minnesota. Jay, how are you? I am fantastic, Ashley, and I have that title, and I'm not relinquishing it to anybody. <laughs> That's fair. You've earned it over time, Jay. So you're joining us for our most recent edition of Planting Knowledge, Growing Success, and today we are going to talk about uh, what's happening within the growing season, crop progress, what are we seeing from reproductive stages by different planting dates, and what do we think of the crop thus far? Jay, can you tune us in on ear fill and pollination success? Uh, absolutely, Ashley. You know, several weeks ago, uh, many of the fields in the area were at that R1 growth stage. So shortly after pollination, and many people were taken to their fields and you know, taking ear samples and, and doing the shake test. As you, as you can see here, uh, illustrated illustrated on on the screen, and you know essentially what that is is you grab an ear, you peel a husk back, and then you gently shake that that ear, and all of the silks that fertilized an ovule on the uh, on the ear, as far as potential kernels, will fall free, and and so that's an indication of where we're at as far as pollination success, but as we progress on to the R2 growth stage and beyond, that's really where the rubber meets the road. And we start looking for things such as, you know, tip fill. And I happen to have uh, a sample ear here where, you know, as, as farmers are walking fields this time of year, a lot of times we begin to see a little bit of tip back on, on ears such as this one here. And really, you know, that's an indication of the fact that there was some stress shortly after that pollination occurred, whether it be due to uh, lack of moisture, certainly not the case this year in our area, uh, fertility concerns, say uh, running short on, on nitrogen, but then also uh, sunlight is another factor that can impact what we might happen to see as far as tip fill. And actually one of the things I tell farmers a lot of times is when they're out there making their checks and they're pulling some of those ears to resist the temptation to look at how much you lost and actually just cover that tip back up with your hand <laughs> like this and then count the number of rows of kernels around in the length. And this is a prime example, actually. This particular ear, I sampled it earlier, counted the number of rows of kernels around in the length. It actually, actually had 20. Yes, two zero, 20 rows of kernels around. And if I went up to about here, it was 36 kernels we'll have to see. So even with some tip back, we've got an excellent ear there, Ashley. Well, that's fantastic. And it's interesting, Jay, as we get to know hybrids, we know some are predispositioned to having more of a tip uh, that, that just seems standard no matter the population dynamic, if it's a high population or low population. Uh, but it is interesting what's available to us from a yield perspective when when we have a, a tip on an ear, despite the fact that we may be really happy with those outcomes. And it, it's an interesting opportunity for products um, like our Nexta product line, our biological product line, to find a place um, within our, our production systems here in Southern Minnesota of how do we mitigate stress during those, those early blister stages and, and try to maintain more yield on that year. I think that's very interesting, Ashley, because I think a lot of times, Farmers will, you know, they'll be scratching their head. They'll see some tip back on a hybrid, and, and you know, they were aggressive as far as their fertility management. You know, they were they were they were using fungicide. They they weren't lacking moisture at all. And so, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting and exciting to see what the future holds to see what we can do to capture more of that potential oh, on some of those products. Absolutely. Okay, so we've talked about looking at at your corn for pollination success, um, seeing if those silks detach would mean they're pollinated. Now we're moving on to green fill so we can really see what's happening from a yield perspective. Jay, can you tell us about general crop progress from a, a maturity or GDU development? Well, certainly, Ashley. And, and where I always you know, like to start out, and I know a lot of farmers, and, and Ashley, you're going to share in a, a bit some, some GDU models, and maybe I'm a little bit more, more old school, but I let the crop tell me how it's moving towards uh, maturity. And, and so a, a few things uh, as, as a rule of thumb, very typically what we see from uh, the R1 growth stage tasseling to physiological maturity, most years that takes about 50 to uh, 60 days. And then from, from that point in time, then I used crop staging in 
uh, you know, we've made reference in our other uh, webinars to this agronomy memo book and a chart we have in there. And so if you don't have one already, I really encourage you to talk to your local Pioneer sales representative. But as, as we look at the chart in, in this book, it helps guide you and help you understand the different reproductive stages and then how many days to physiological maturity. And so the the sample ear that I, I used earlier to demonstrate and talk about tip back, I'd say is solidly in that R3 uh, or milk stage. And if you look at late R3, it would suggest that uh, we're about 30 days away from physiological maturity. And so when we look at that, Ashley, I'm telling myself, guys better be ready. 15th of September, I think we could have some corn reach physiological maturity. Now this location, by the way, that we're sitting in front of was planted the uh, the 14th of, of April this year. So got an early start. Oh, perfect. And I actually, when I looked at GDU accumulation, the 14th of April was one of the dates I pulled. Granted, I, I pulled that information from pioneer.com. If you go on pioneer.com, um, and there's a tool section that you can look at and you can put in your own zip code or location, um, your respective planting date. And you can even put in the hybrid maturity that you planted and get an estimate of GDU accumulation in your particular area. So I did that for Oatana, assuming that's that's central to the area that that we're, we're supporting here. And so I pulled that for April 14th being a kickoff planting date for some. And so my accumulated GDUs from pioneer.com was 1,869, which was 75 GDUs ahead of the five-year average. So it makes sense the anticipation that we would be running ahead of schedule, seeing the crop a little ahead of schedule from those planting dates. Then I plugged in May 5th. And so that was a big planting date that remember that was the kickoff and we for the May planting was in that area. And then we had a long stretch of planting that, that didn't quit. Um, we're 33 GDUs ahead of the five-year average there. And then when we got to that tie up on the back end of May, I, I looked at May 25th and we're actually about 12 behind. But the interesting thing about GDUs is the, the, the calculation only looks at the, the high temperature for the day and the low temperature, but it doesn't take into consideration the duration of time that we existed in those high temperatures. So it's not a perfect system. And, and I would I would offer from, from these numbers, um, that I, I can see the crop coming in earlier than our five-year average from a maturity perspective. But if we look at those planting dates on a five-year average, a uh, 105-day product planted on April 14th would tend to black layer the middle of September when we plant a 105-day product, which is Jay's right on. So yeah, that's a good gut feeling. So Ashley, I always like to listen to the ear. The ears tell me how, how we're doing as far as crop development. But you, you seem to have a good connection there. So you're reading that one right. The May 5th uh, planting date, 105 days expected to black layer on average about six, September 16th. Um, and then that late May planting date, 105 day maturity, five year average uh, black layering around September 19th. Um, so we should start seeing black layer physiological maturity and crops planted in this area middle of September. Um, so that's really exciting. If you want to look that up for yourself too, if you have uh, your as planted information, you know, your hybrids and your planted dates um, connected to our granular insights tool, you can see there in in-season monitoring uh, GDU accumulation per field and how many GDUs that particular product needs to black layer. So definitely something to look into there um, or use pioneer.com um, RG GDU tracking tool. So Ashley, I hate to uh, you know put a damper on a bit of this, and and you know the interesting thing is farmers, and 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 most of you are well aware of it. This time of year, most years, we're wondering and worrying, are we going to get this crop to maturity before the first frost date? And if we look at uh, the ears, if we look at the GDU numbers, it's telling us that we're tracking uh, ahead of normal. And, you know, not to throw some, you know, wet wa water on the whole issue here, but, you know, the question I have and beginning to wonder, and I think others are as well, is are we pushing this crop a little too fast to, uh, to maturity? And actually, you know, I always, I always like to joke with farmers and others is that, you know, that grain likes to get made in a crock pot, mm. not in a microwave, you know? And you see, we got this trusty corn powered uh, crock pot here, but in, all kidding aside, uh, it is one of the concerns I have is that could that potentially take 
a little bit of the edge off of this year's uh, crop. If we look at some of the models that are out there, uh, and actually Pioneer had done some research a number of years back, and, and I have this shared on the screen as well, looking at the impact of those warm nighttime temperatures during grain fill. And we have some overnight temperatures in the 70s that begin to take a toll on the crop uh, and takes away from what it can potentially uh, put into uh, kernel, uh, kernel fill and grain fill and ultimately uh, the yield impact. So I uh, hate to be a downer, but it's, it's the one thing I'm gonna be watching for, Ari, uh, Ashley, as I've seen other years. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. There's, there's been a number of questions of, okay, how are we tracking? So we've talked about that, but then really the big question on everyone's mind is, is what's out here from a, a yield perspective. We'll soon have the, the pro farmer tour circulating throughout the Midwest, making their conclusion in Rochester. And a lot of us like to, to play along at home and conduct our own yield estimates. Jay, can you share process on the pro farmer yield estimate? And we'll talk about other forms of estimation as well. Certainly, Ashley. And over the years, I've had uh, fun this time of year in anticipation and build up to the pro farmer tour, walking fields with uh, farmers in my area, and then utilizing that, that pro farmer uh, method. And, uh, uh, you know, as you can see on the screen here, we kind of, kind of laid out uh, how the process works. And so, you know, your particular field that you want to sample, the method they use is going in at least 35 paces beyond the end rows. Certainly in your own field, you don't have to be efficient and cover hundreds of fields in a day. So I would encourage you to get out in a representative portion of the field. Then uh, you measure out with a, with a tape measure or, or maybe you even use a, a rope or something you have already measured to 30 feet. Uh, and then you count the number of plants uh, in two adjacent rows in that those 30 feet. And uh, you, you take uh, the average number of years in that particular distance. And then you take some sample ears. You sample the fifth, eighth, and 11th ear. And then if you don't want to do the count out in the field, you can go back to the pickup. And then what you do at that point in time is then measure the length and inches of the ears those three ears and take an average of it, and then count the number of rows of kernels around that ear, uh, those ears, and take an average of that. And then, and then it comes time to do the math and have it illustrated here on the screen uh, as well. So uh, in the example I use, we found 60 years in that 30 foot distance. They averaged 16 and a half rows of kernels around. So a little bit less than this 20 row kernel here. here. Um, and then, uh, at the average uh, length was seven inches. And so you do the math on those and then you multiply by your row width. In this example, I used a 30 inch uh, row width and you see we came up with 231 bushel the acre uh, estimate. Ashley, and you know, I, I've done, done a lot of work over the years, whether it be the, the pro farmer method or, you know, in the old days, we actually had a slide rule to do these things. And you know, what we found is that one of the limitations is that it does not factor in kernel size or kernel weight. We can speed this up in Granular Insights. Go into your operation in Granular Insights, select a farm where you're running this estimate. Um, you'll see a plus sign in the bottom right corner. We'll tap on that. And from there, you can indicate that you'd like to do a yield estimate. Next, you'll have the ear phytometry available to you in which you can hold that ear Hover your camera in front of it until the box turns green, you'll see on the screen. And that means that we are now counting kernels. You see that red dot on each um, kernel that is being estimated by the, the phytometry app. Um, then it'll calculate those average kernels. You need to tell the program how many plants per acre. It's going to default at 32,000. And you need to indicate a factor. It's going to default at 90,000, but you can change that in increments of five, at least through three years. There you can get your estimate and, and enjoy playing around with that. That'll That's a lot of fun for, for many. And my hot tip, Ashley, when you utilize that photometry app, because sometimes it might count some of these kernels here that Ashley was talking about near the tip. And then again, I put my hand oh. over the cob and then hold the camera up uh, to, to get a shot of that. And if you look real close, we actually have a friendly northern corn rootworm beetle that decided it wanted to get an early opportunity to feast on some of this corn. But actually, uh, that photometry app is, is pretty exciting and pretty neat tool to use. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of it. And that's available to, to any of our customers. And if you have challenges or, or would like to learn more, of course, reach out to your Pioneer sales rep. Um, and there are tools available too, if, if you would like information on yield potential by farm, provided that you have 
um, your as planned and information shared with with us in Granular Insights, we can provide you a little more detail on, on potential um, yield opportunity or, or yield estimate from us if you reach out to your Pioneer sales rep. Jay, we talked a lot about a lot of fun things today. Um, what else do our listeners need to know? Well, actually, we, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about uh, you know e evaluating uh, grain fill or, or, or tip fill um, and, and reasons why we might see some tip back. We also talked about crop development and the fact that the crop appears at this point in time to pro be progressing ahead of normal. And then we also shared some thoughts on making those uh, yield checks and having a couple of different tools. But I want to go back to that second point because, uh, you know, as I've been visiting with farmers lately, my biggest concern is, okay, are you ready for harvest to be substantially earlier than normal? And, and I know every year that's, that's the cry that, far, that agronomists have out there. A lot of times it's maybe because there's stock quality concerns and other things such as that. But we've got a crop that's progressing towards maturity very, very rapidly. I think it's important that people uh, get the combines greased up and ready to go because I think it's going to be an early harvest and you want to maximize yield by getting that corn harvested early. Once it starts dropping much below 20% moisture, you're losing some yield due to the mystery yield loss. So uh, again, folks, I think that's the final uh, point that I'd like to make. Ashley, bring things to a close and we'll wrap Absolutely. it up. Absolutely. Ah, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate your uh, participation or taking in our video here, our past videos, and we have one more coming for you in our series of planting knowledge, growing success. Um, to learn more about the latest four seed and list products, power corn list products, and Z series soybeans. So that's coming up next for you. This has been Planting Knowledge, Growing Success. Thank you. That concludes this Pioneer Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.